pages. How long do you normally do your episodes for? Because some of these stories, mate, like some of these stories, go. there's I don't so have a time much later. to them, and it's like well, let's go into them. I love okay. talks like this. We can go for two hours if we need. Yeah, because sometimes like these stories, so many. There's so many little yeah, parts. Yeah, let's go that into it. Important. I love that. Okay. It's like my favorite thing about the podcast. I don't Sweet. have a set time. Okay. I usually aim for like an hour to an hour 20 but yep. if we need two hours we need two hours yeah I'm mate, fucking I chilling try and chew your um, ear off but if it's no no I'm like all about that. chewing the ear off like fuck I, I think the sickest thing about having this podcast and this is what I like always say is like last year I had 52 incredible like hour conversations learning someone's story like yeah. as much as we're mates I'm sure a lot of your good mates probably wouldn't have heard as much as we'll talk about today yeah, so it's sure. really good to like and it's a good way for to sure. reflect on um what's been but sweet everything's recording we'll get into it cool mate Welcome to Good Humans Podcast. Clint Kimmins, how you going, brother? <laughs> Mate, I'm good. I'm stoked to be here, actually. It's going to be a good chat. I know. This is going to be fun. We've been talking about this for a little while, and you have maybe one of the most unique stories of anyone who's um, come on this podcast, which I'm really excited to talk about. We did touch on a few things um, before recording, and I think the listeners are going to be blown away by your story and super intrigued. So to kick off, what are you grateful for right now? Mate, I'm grateful probably for my health and waking up without injuries and having friends some money in my bank account a roof over my head simple stuff yeah i bloody love that it's so nice to just reflect on those simple things we take them for granted so often but one thing i do have to start this podcast with a rep is our brain drink sponsor and you've tried it before you said and you love it so (laughs) mate we've got a couple of them on the table you said we might need a couple of hours to get through this chat because your story is a long one so we've got a few rappers on the table cheers Cheers. i've already started mine yeah Yeah, we're we're good to go yeah Yeah. like you said you know about a rapper and you're super into high performance with all the um stuff you're doing in endurance um endurance athlete <laughs> endurance endurance yeah, races all of the stuff. Above, but just anyone who's got a brain should know um how important it is to take care of it so yeah i was saying to you before it's like the neuroscience behind it is the thing that i really like and i know you're super into the science behind stuff so to have a product like this sponsor and good humans podcast i'm very grateful and i'm sure you will be after the hour have you tried the fizzy one before i just- have yeah they, they they actually sent me um some product to try and i totally loved it but you know Clint got in his own head and probably didn't give them the feedback that they deserved <laughs> and I loved it and it's it's pretty rare and I mean this wholeheartedly that it's rare that you try a product and you feel a difference but mm. when I did try this sort of stuff placebo or not I started to feel really good mm. and again like I try a lot of products with what I do I'm really in tune with my body through the sports that mm. I do and when I took this product I actually really liked it so um Beautiful. Hopefully that's a good enough plug to get another box. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you some more sent yeah. out for sure. They're, uh, they're absolute legends and um, they support me and they're going to support all the guests on this podcast this year. So Sick. we're stoked. But let's um, let's get into your story, man. Where'd you grow up? <laughs> what was life like as a kid? What were your family dynamics as um, yeah, a kid, let's say, up until sort of early high school? Mate, I grew up on the Gold Coast. I was born in Southport Hospital. Um, growing up, I was into all the sports, surfing, football, cricket, touch football, um, basically anything that I could do. And then um, oddly, just not oddly really, growing up on the Gold Coast, but fell in love with surfing more than anything. Um, I was making representative teams through school and, you know, touch football and cricket and things like that. But I started to not turn up to training because the surf was good. (laughs) Sounds like me. (laughs) Yeah, like just surfing just grabbed my attention, you know. It was a connection with the outdoors that I really liked. Growing up really close to the ocean, my dad was a surfer and a keen surfer and would take me down the beach. And, um, mate, it's just something I fell in love with from a really young age and was I'm super fortunate to be able to, you know, have travelled the world through surfing, had sponsors and basically lived the dream. You know, I'm really thankful for my dad getting me into that sport. But um, in terms of the home life, it was, uh, it was honestly pretty tricky. My parents really struggled with alcoholism um some drug use and without trying to play the fiddle my home life was pretty traumatic um there was physical violence between my parents um and now that I'm a bit older I really see who why I am the person I am today and what drew me to competing from a young age and it was to totally stay away from home Mm. You know, the more success I got as a surfer was the more opportunity I got to travel. And while I wasn't tra- while I was traveling, I wasn't dealing with the home life. And while I was off 
living the dream. My sister was stuck at home. So um, again, through maturity and trying to do the work on myself and really uncover these past traumas and why I am the person I am today, a lot of it is because of my upbringing and how traumatic my home life was. But, you know, there's two ways to look at it, right? You can kick stones in the gutter and say, poor me, and go down the path of... Victim. Yeah, play the victim role and what happened to your parents, it's not my fault, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Or you can go down the other road and go, all right, I want to be the circuit breaker. I don't want to live that sort of life. I want to be the polar opposite. Um, and that's what I think I'm trying to become now at this you know, ripe age of 38 years old. I want to be the circuit breaker. I don't want to start a family and bring them up in a trauma of what I was going through because I know the pains of that. For a long time, I didn't want a family because I was too scared to potentially turn out like my parents. So I think I self-sabotaged a lot of relationships, especially really serious ones with good people where the thought of starting a family in terms of kids and marriage just scared me so much. Like I, looking back on it now of how much of a coward I was to not really face those traumas and try and get over them and, and to move on in life. But in recent months and years I've really done the work on myself lots of reading lots of podcasts lots of self-evaluation and um, I think I'm in a really good place now where I'm excited to be a father one day I want to get married I want to love I want to receive love and I'm in a really good place right now where I'm just ready to look at the rest of my life and um, and move on with it yeah. in an open and honest manner so Whilst my childhood was traumatic and I guess you'd say bad in a certain way, it's also turned me into the person I am now that I'm really proud of and I'm, I want to share the product of myself with somebody else mm. because I feel like I can give them something that they deserve. I think I can be that person to help them grow through hard times because I've dealt with so much myself. So um, yeah, I'm excited for the future. Man, it's, um, it's really nice to hear you reflect on that and see where you've come from and where you are mm. now. And I know there's plenty in between that we're going to mm. continue to get through oh. that's really shaped who you are today because the self-awareness and the, I think, like open-mindedness you have for your future is really exciting. And some of the um, things that you've done, some of the things you've been through throughout your career um, are going to be really fun to sort of catch back up on to how mm. you're feeling today. But Let's talk about high school. What was it like? Was high school a bit of an escape for you, getting away from the family life at home? How'd you do at school? Or was it kind of from a pretty young age, like 12, 13, you know what, surfing's starting to become pretty successful, little comps around the town. But And as well, I know when I was young, it was really important to have my parents' support to get me to my events and stuff. Mm. How was that for you with um, a bit of a broken home at home? Um, yeah, really, really good question, to be honest. Um I grew up around Dean Morrison, Joel Parkinson, Mick Fanning. Um, Dean and Joel both went to my school. They're a few years older than me. Those guys are some of the most successful surfers in the world. And I was a few years below them. I didn't really enjoy school in the terms of sitting down in classroom, you know, turning on a Bunsen burner because even from a young age, I think the curriculum wasn't sorted to the lifestyle that I wanted to live. And I, I, I think I was pretty in tune with my intuition that this doesn't feel right for me like mm -hmm. the current school the way of the way schools are I just didn't connect yeah I didn't connect with it um but at the same time I got to go to school and hang out with Dean and Joel and go surfing as a subject at that time PBC uh Eleanora Eleanora yeah so Eleanora High School was actually one of the first schools I think maybe the first school in Australia if not the world that made surfing a subject wow so and this school only had three periods per day i think they were an hour and a half periods so if surfing was the first period you'd turn up at the surf at 5 30 a.m surf before school when school was starting at 8 39 or whatever would surf for an hour and a half and do have little comps and film each other and you know do judging courses and then you'd get to surf through the first break and then not get to school until like 12 o'clock <laughs> so for me half of my uh, high school was just going surfing and the rest I was just like okay I just got to be here and tick the box and yeah. show my presence but um I left school I think just before I finished year 10 I was into it I did apply myself I got really good grades and then I think just my attendance started going by the wayside 
I was hanging out with um, with Dino a lot. My mum, I don't know if you'd call it an accident, but she had a fall or something might have happened. It was after a um, after a presentation, a surfing contest that I'd won. You know, I accepted my award and went home from a young age and then my mum stayed there drinking and whatever and actually fell over or something might have happened to her. We still don't know. And she went into a coma and was in a coma for quite some time. And at that time, I was already aware of how bad the alcoholism was within my family and it sort of gave my parents ultimatums alcohol or your family like if you want me as your son are you really gonna continue this sort of lifestyle and then I ended up moving in with Dino and um, Robert Bartholomew down at Kira and then we just took the piss and just went surfing and Bugs being the incredible person he is was pretty lenient to let us go surfing and not turn up to school and then obviously when you have competitions and the junior series my attendance just fell by the wayside and I got called into the office and they were like you know we can't expel you but we don't really want you here sort of thing like what, what's, what's going on and um, then I think it rolled around to early November when that, that year was starting to wrap up and I got a ticket to Hawaii to go and stay with Jamie O'Brien and surf pipe and, and you're sponsored at this time sponsored by rip curl and whatnot and they wanted me over there to um basically start experiencing the north shore from a young age and i remember riding home into a northerly wind because i'd just ride my bike around and getting back to the part where you said how was it getting to contests and things i was always a kid rocking up on a on a rickety old bike and it was rusty and i'd have this old bunger board or whatever and end up winning the contest you know, by riding my bike there in the rain or something like that while the while the other crew are getting driven around in Lexuses and stuff. But again, I'm not saying that in a point where poor me, it's actually, it created the person I am. It mm. gave me that drive from a young age to not really show anyone, but I guess it just, there's substance to it. It's like, well, mm. if I'm going to ride my bike in the rain, I might as well make something of this yeah. event. So it gave me that extra motivation. And while I was never the most, I guess, talented surfer, my style is pretty average. I wasn't doing the stuff that the other guys were doing free surfing. I think that tenacity and that drive was that extra ten mm. percent. That will to win. That will to win mm. has got me over the line, and I think I actually probably overachieved in my early years by having that tenacity. Me so, too, I reckon. What's that? Me too, I reckon a little oh, bit. I don't know, mate. You're you're <laughs> you're, you're a good surfer. <laughs> oh, so um, are you. But yeah, so go on. So. Drop out of school, doing junior series events, sponsor to go to Hawaii. What yeah. was that first Hawaii trip like? Insane. I remember um, going there with a Gary Dunn, the team manager for Rip Curl at the time. Choco. I think Choco, yeah. I think Hedgie he was in the car. Me for Rip Did he? When I was like ten. What a legend. <laughs> um, you know, I think Zane Harrison, Mick might have been in the car, and like I flew over there with Parco, and like you know, I was like all of a sudden, like here we go. This is mm. this is pro surfing. Like there was signs of it from a young age of you know because you go and you get stickers on your board and yeah. you know go in a contest and getting boxes of free clothes but then when you start traveling for free and getting yeah. looked after by team managers and you're in the, the rip curl car going to stay at the you know Jamie O'Brien's house or the rip curl team mm. house you're like here we go and first time I um we arrived in the night back then I remember going down the beach at pipe and just touching the sand and just bawling my eyes out like I was just over the moon I um I grew up watching all the Hawaii 9 films like Hawaii 9 Hawaii 9 and for some reason Hawaii just has such a powerful I just have such a powerful connection with it that when I was there I was like I felt like I was at home mm. and I was like this place is going to give me so much and it did Hawaii gave me so much and formed so many strong relationships there you know yourself how hard it is to break into mm. to that scene there on the North Shore, especially for that one to three months of the year where it's just all the local guys are going gangbusters trying yeah. to get their shots. And as a blow-in, you know, you've got to do your time and um, pay, your, pay your dues. And, mm. you know, I was there at 13 years old getting a head start on paying 13, my dues. was that first time? Yeah. yeah. Oh, 13 or 14. I can't remember exactly. What was I, year nine? What's so that? still Maybe in school, so you went there in yeah. school, and then the next year, you're just like... I didn't oh, go back to school. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was getting paid good money at the time, and I was getting probably paid more than what the teachers were at the school, and, you know, I was just like, this is me. Winning it's, comps in Australia. Yeah. So, just never went back. So, let's talk that 16 to 20 period, junior series, doing mm. well in the junior series, you won a world title, mm. let's... um, You probably caught sort of your heydays in your surf career, let's talk about that period, how it was for you. Mate, I think it was the heydays for surfing mm. and the surfing industry in general. The 
sport was just booming. Everyone had a Bill like Quicksilver Andy, rip curl Nick kind of time. No, Andy Kelly era. Yeah, or even they really? were the grommets then. Oh wow! You know? So like that makes me feel pretty old saying that. <laughs> the, um, but Oki. yeah, like they yeah like this is when I think Ock won his world title in two thousand yeah. or maybe that was ninety nine. Yeah, Sonny was maybe two thousand. Yeah, but um, yeah, that was just the golden years, and you know I was getting paid buckets of money and. I was sponsored by Nev Hyman and I was getting like a brand new 30 board quiver each Hawaii trip, everything from 9.6 or 10.2 down to Fishers and alternative boards and life's good. Life was good, man. Like it was just like, this is, I I am where I'm meant to be at and which really made me sort of push aside all the family life stuff. And I think for a number of years, I pushed that stuff deep down in a place that I didn't have to really um, face it. Yeah, exactly. Didn't mm. have to face it because why would you? Mm, you life's know, good. Living the dream. Yeah. And um, yeah, I had really good results on the junior series. and You won a junior world title? Won a junior world title over in Bali, um, which is obviously a huge highlight and something that's bloody good to have on your resume for the rest of your days. Yeah. I'll probably be in the pub <laughs> 20 years from now talking <laughs> about it. But um, mate, everything was just on this trajectory that I was just, I couldn't see it stopping. No way in the world. Um, and then it all changed, eh? Let's yeah. Talk about we talked about this story before, but um, I think the listeners will. I think it's going to give a different take on what prison is and what the legal system is. So, mm. a little pre warner. This part of the story does get a bit hectic, but yeah, yeah. As much as you're willing to share, I think it's um, an oh. important one to show who you are and why you are with the way you are now. Yeah, of course. So. Um I guess we'll start with a short version of the story. At I think at the age of 20, I went to a friend's 21st birthday party and got into an altercation there. And um, That was a longer part. It makes more sense. We talked about this before. Some random guys rock up. Yeah. All right. Explain the context. It'll explain yeah, the context it's, more. Um, we got all that. <laughs> it's, it's a weird one. It's the best and worst thing that ever happened to me. Um, mate's 21st birthday party. It was a family party at the Tugan Surf Club. You know, grandmas, families, you know, also us there drinking beers. That was a bar tab. And I just remember the waves were going to be really good the next day. So I wanted to be in control of myself, drinking light and mid beers. But you're 20 years old at your mate's 21st. You want to have a good time. Mm. And we're all there having a good time. These dudes turned up, a bunch of guys who look like football players in white singlets sort of turned up and started like trashing the place and carrying on a little bit. And then, um, we sort of, myself, Hippo, and a couple other guys, Ryan Hippwood, yeah. bowed them up and was like, what's it doing, boys? Like, you know, you can't just come in here. And I think at this time someone had, like, kicked a toilet in and smashed something, and then we all sort of went there and were like, what's going on? Like, pull your heads in. We're like, who are you guys? And it turns out they were friends of a friend who mentioned there might be a party and whatever. And then um, I kept carrying on, and then it got to the point where it's like, well, I saw this guy pinch Ryan Hippwood's sister on the bum. And I was just like, what's going on here? And then we went over and it was like, boys, you're out of here. And then it was just on, like a fight just broke out. And then somehow... like, I'm And this is different to nowadays a fight breaking out. This is 20 years ago where a punch on's a bit more common than I feel like yeah. nowadays. Like back then, like, you know, yeah. I, we used to get in all these fights all the time and it wasn't like we went out looking for trouble. Like I'm the guy who runs from things or whatever. Yeah. But like when you're kids, it's like you would... You know, I defended myself. I was like, I guess, known as a pro surfer and we used to get picked on and bullied quite a bit and I always stood up for myself. Um, And I always will stand up for myself no matter what. I'll stand up for my friends, my family and myself first and foremost. You know, I'm um, I'm a soft, gentle person, but I'm also deep down an alpha male who doesn't like to take a lot of shit, you know. Um, Especially if it's physical abuse like that. And then um, somehow had a fight with this guy who's much bigger than myself somehow I think got him and you know gave him a bit of a touch up on the dance floor and then the security guards from the party jumped in and kicked these people out and party went on for another two or three hours and it was time to leave I think there was a bus well there was a bus that Hippo's dad had hired for everyone to go out to surface and I was going to get dropped off on the way home because I was living on the way to surface we walked downstairs I was one of the first few people that were there that walked down the stairs and then um, I guess these guys went away and got a whole bunch more people and came back to, to get us and then uh, walked down and I just remember it, you know, 
whole bunch of guys coming at me and just punches were thrown and just the bang, 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 bang. And then all of a sudden I was on the ground just feeling these like, I remember them being really dull thuds. And then I can remember tasting like what could be described as like a metal taste in my mouth. And I just remember thinking, this is not good. One of these things pretty soon is going to dust me, you know, yeah. and I was doing all this sort of thing and just, you know, trying to hide from it. And it was just like kicks going everywhere. And then look over and saw a little sparkle and pick this thing up turned out to be like the top of a, a small bottle and I remember it just being clear and then I just remember like kind of doing that getting in my feet and then just going bananas with it as hard as I could and this guy was coming at me and I just remember going like that and I remember just seeing this guy's neck well, it was this side I think left side just opening up and folding and I was just like that chunk of like meat coming off this guy's neck and I just remember everything just stopped like it went into slow motion just going what just happened and then um everything sort of stopped there i think it freaked a lot of people out and my friends were fighting his friends and it was this huge sort of like group brawl and then i just remember seeing his neck and i just remember saying you guys run that way we'll run this way and then just the seas parted all of his crew ran that way we went that way and then um i remember the waves again they were pumping the next morning and i was on a jet ski down at one of the local reef breaks here and I felt sick to my stomach. I couldn't even paddle out. Like I went to like paddle out and I was just like, what has just happened? Like it was just such a horrible thing. And I was, I even remember back then going, well, what if I didn't do that? You know, like I was literally defending myself and I can't believe what happened happened. And then um, this guy rang me the next day, sort of apologetically. Like, um, so he what? survived. He, yeah, he, he, yeah. Um, he went to hospital. And I guess when you go to hospital... Yeah. With these sort of wounds, the hospital's like, what happened? And if you're in a fight, then they call the police and go through um, the process of that. And then um, when he gave me a call, he was just like, man, like, what happened? Why'd you do that? And I explained why and what happened. And then I was like, well, why'd you do this? And we ended up having a pretty decent conversation, just like, mate, I was like, I'm glad you're okay. I'm sorry for what happened, but what happened happened. And he was also a bit apologetic for causing the whole thing. And then we sort of just separated. I was like, man, I hope you recover. Good luck. And he's like, yeah, no worries. You know, either I'm signing myself out or I just got out of hospital. And I was like, okay, cool. Good luck with the recovery. And then um, following days, I was receiving death threats. And in those coming days, found out that this guy was a pretty full-time drug dealer. Um, getting all these stories that he's not the person to be messed with and he's in this big pill-pressing racket. And I was just like, it's got nothing to do with me. Whatever is what it is. Um and then I was, again, I was getting all these death threats and I remember either him texting me or ringing me just saying, come down to Byron and we can sort this whole thing out now. And automatically I'm like, well, this is a stitch up. I'm getting death threats. I don't really want to be going down to Byron Bay. I spoke to people about it and they're like, you're absolutely not good to go down to Byron Bay. This is a full blown stitch up. You're mm. just going to get down there and get flogged. Yeah. And then I was like, okay. You know, and again, back then it was a bit of the Wild West. It's not like now where there was cameras and all this sort of mm. stuff out. It was a bit like that's what used to happen. People would go down there and sort things out. You yeah. know, fight for fight, tooth for tooth, like all that sort of thing. And um, I was just like, absolutely not. You know, I just went away and kept surfing, doing my thing. And, and at then, this um, time you're still competing for a yeah. year or two, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So I was just life was moving on you know it was something tragic that happened and he's okay i'm okay we spoke about it let's just move on and then um like a year year and a half maybe even close to two years um had a call from um the burley crime scene investigation bureau or whatnot and um asked to meet at a place and then at this stage I went and got a lawyer and whatnot and met in the lawyer's office and he's like, we, we're going to be charging you with unlawful wounding. And at the time I was like, okay, this is heavy, this is serious, this is not good, but I defended myself. I knew the truth of what happened and we spoke about it and if anything progresses from this, just tell the story. I'm sure he'll tell the story and that yeah. will be that. And then... Because, uh, yeah, it wasn't him pressing charges, it was the police because they have to... Exactly, yeah, and I get the process, you know. You can't just have some young kid walking into a hospital with a chunk of flesh missing from his neck and potentially glass in his neck. They need to follow that up yeah. with what happened because when you look at it like that, it sounds really horrible, you know. It's like someone's committed a crime here. Yeah. But as the story goes, like I said, it was, you know, it was, it was a self-defense thing. Um, 
And then uh, I just remember my lawyer's going, don't worry, we'll handle this. Go do your job. Keep traveling. Everything's going to be fine. And then um, it went to, like I admitted to the whole thing, told the story to the police. They're like, yep, yep, no worries. It's going to actually have to go to trial. And then six weeks before the trial, the the law team that I employed dropped me. This guy was just coming back into criminal law. This was his first case that he had taken since coming back into criminal law. And they just said, we don't think you're going to win this case. I don't want this to be on my record. We're going to have to drop you from being a client. And then my girlfriend at the time's dad um, got wind of that, obviously. And he's like, we're going to go get you the best lawyers money can buy. Took me to um, a guy named Bill Potts, who's the best criminal lawyer, definitely on the Gold Coast, if not Australia. And I was a bit reluctant at the start because I'd been saving for a house deposit at this time and I know what these mm, fees cost and you know, going to trials, no, no cheap thing. And then um, he's just like, mate, I don't care. We need to get you out of this and the good bloke that he is. So we had six weeks to pre- prepare for the trial and I remember being in the office most days with them preparing for this case and I just remember Bill saying to me if you came to me at the start we would have got this quashed without even a hearing he goes this is just like one of the more ridiculous cases I've ever seen but in saying that we need to move yeah, on with the trial in situation yeah yep so it went to trial mm-hmm. in the not the supreme court in I don't even know what it's called but you know a few levels up and whatnot went for three weeks you know through like I think it went for like 14 days or something like that so Monday to Friday Monday to Friday Monday to Thursday and then I just remember at the time just picking up the newspaper I think it was front page news multiple days you know fold outs on the case and I remember having really good days in court that everything went my way I was like that was actually really good like yeah this is positive it's moving in the way that I thought it would and then picking up the paper the next day and it's like making me look like this villain you know this guy who just woke up and decided to grab a bottle and go harm someone and that's what gave me a lot of um distrust in the media and especially journalism from a pretty young age seeing what they wrote about me not stating the facts of what happened in court and just sensationalizing something that's going to get back then it wasn't clicks but it's basically clickbait yeah. back then by um print media and then uh when it came time to um sentencing they ask for something that's, I believe, is quite rare in the system. It's called a special verdict, where they break down each wound as an individual case. So he had a wound in his neck here, which was deemed by the courts a self-defence. There was something else down here, self-defence. Another mark on his shoulder, self-defence. And then he had a small mark in his back, which I'm guessing is from rolling around in glass or maybe yeah, something happened, fighting, yeah, whatever, yeah. I, I don't know they couldn't justify that as self-defense. But during the course, I, the, the case, I do remember him saying that I lunged at him, chased them down the beach and lunged at them and wounded him in the back. That's how he said he got the wound in his back, which is, yeah, which is far from the truth. But um, I don't even know how that got there in all honesty. And they couldn't justify a wound in the back as self-defense. And I get it. Like it's, I wouldn't either, but... Mm. They, but how can they prove that you made the wound? They can't. Yeah. Well, even yeah. when I was in jail, a guy said to me, he goes, what, so what do you do if you chase someone down the beach, right? You go like that. If you're lunging at someone, mm. if you're running, do you go like that? Because yeah. he asked how I was holding the thing. And I just said, I picked it up like that and yeah. whatever. And then he's like, what, are you going to run and go like that? And yeah. I don't know, it might not mean anything. But anyway, um, I guess I they were looking for comparable sentences and things like that with being found guilty of unlawful wounding, which was that wound in his back, which carries a jail sentence. So I was sentenced to jail for 18 months, suspended after six months, which means if you know, I get through there clean and don't do anything, I get out after six months for a two-year operative. So after that six months, there's 18 good months, basically behavior good behaviour. Yeah. And if you cross the road the wrong way, I guess you go back and serve the remaining 18 months yeah. or even two years, I can't remember. And then... Um, I just remember him saying all of that stuff. Well, actually, in his summary, I remember it was like he was not praising me by any means, but I remember him saying things along the lines of, you know, it's a real tragedy. This has happened. You've got a young athlete here with no criminal um, background, no fight history, who's got excellent character witnesses like, you know, guys like Kelly Slater, Taj Burrow, 
um, predominant business members of the community came in as character witnesses for me. Um, and they just said that it's a tragedy that some, a kid like this has fallen down a crack in the system that 99.9% .9 of people step over. Mm. One minute you are legally defending yourself in a legal manner against something life-threatening and then one split second later you're committing a jailable offence. Yeah. And I just remember hearing that going, well, you know, all very well and good, maybe I'm not going to jail. And then you had to go through the process of reading out my, my sentencing. And I remember just the whole... Hit the hammer. You know, the hammer hit. And then just people were in tears. The The gallery was full of media and friends and my girlfriend and her family at the time. And I just remember looking over at them. You know, they were hysterical. I was just, I think, a little bit in shock. And the officer comes and puts your hands behind your back. And I was in the dock at the time. And then they take you through a door out the back of the dock and you're in jail. I, I remember vividly my lawyers, Bill and Karen, Karen just saying to me, she's like, Clint, you're going to jail. This is a time to be strong. This is a time to be a man. This is going to happen. And as much as it's going to happen, it's also going to end. One day you will look back at this and it will be a thing of the past. Now is the time to be strong. And I just remember that hitting me just like an absolute ton of bricks. And I think that's when you really go into that fight or flight state of just like, here we go. And I was, it's hard to explain the emotion of it, I think. Like, because you don't want to like cry and be weak because you're about to go into prison with a bunch of, yeah. Uh, it's, well, you're in shock. I, th yeah. I think you're in shock. So I remember just like probably gritting my teeth and being like, okay, this is it. Let's, let's do this type thing. And like, but then also, the very next thought is pure fear. You know, like mm. I was a skinny little blonde haired pro surfer. pro surfer with blonde hair and living the dream. And all of a sudden I was not only going to jail, but I was going to a maximum security jail because it was a violent offence. That And you don't get classified. You have to serve time in a high to maximum security jail for what you've done. And yeah, it was just, it was just wild. And I remember getting, having that chat with them and then you know, some time passed. And then I remember going out the back into an elevator that goes down underground into like the holding cells, like the watch house, um, lockups or whatever they're called. I remember sitting there in my suit and just, it was dark, it was cold. It was jail straight off the bat. 10 minutes ago, I was free, sitting in court. Yeah. And all of a sudden my life was what felt like at the time over. And I, you know, even though Karen said what she said, I couldn't, I just couldn't imagine that this was one day going to be a thing of the past because I knew what was ahead in of me. In the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, also, I remember sitting there and then it was time for them to take my clothes and put them in a bag and then, you know, you get naked and you get your prison browns and, you know, you automatically think, oh, you know, prison clothes. But it's the, it's these small little details that really hit home and affect you. I remember the clothes stunk. They had holes in them. The shirt was small. The pants were big. Little things like that just really, like, I don't care about you. Here's your uniform, whatever. And the people down there, the police down in the holding cell were so nice to me. They were like... I'm not going to say I felt sorry for me or anything, but they knew. Like, they people know yeah, that you're, story, not, yeah. you're, you're not that guy, you know? And they were polite to me, but I remember them going, okay, it's time to go in. And, like, when you go into this holding cell, they've got these blinds down, and they're like, don't tell them your name. Don't tell them what you're in for. Tell them straight away you've got no drugs, you're not into drugs, but just good luck type thing. And I was like, okay, let's go. Took me out of the cell, like, the holding cell that I was in, through down, like, a little hallway open the door and then you know you walk in and there was like I think like eight or ten people in there and like hyenas half of them came up to me what do you got what do you got bro like what do you have and like because they're all clucking some of the junkies coming down off drugs some like I guess and I learned pretty quickly that when you get pinched or when you get locked up a lot of people stash things to give to people who might mm. be coming down and that's the the currency of the, the system and I'm just like Oh, 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 like, what do you mean? Like, have something. Like, drugs would never even be in my yeah. head. But, you know, and I was just so naive and such a kid getting thrown into such a heavy situation that I just had to wing it and, I guess, learn and adapt straight away. And I remember just putting on the front and, what are you in for? And I just remember saying, oh, I'm just too many, you know, this and that and fight here and theft there and just, oh, it doesn't matter and playing it off. And then they're like, what's your name? Told them my name, which I was told not to do. And anyway, it was, 
The holding cell is nearly one of the worst parts of the whole experience. There's blood on the walls. There's fingernails where paint was scratched off the wall. People were literally scraping the paint off the wall, rolling it up with toilet paper into cardboard toilet rolls and smoking it. And the smell, just the whole surroundings. And I'm, you know, I was a pro surfer and I'm just like... A week ago. Yeah, like here we go, wow. And also I remember being in the holding cell and just laying there and you get in this like sort of communal area and then everyone sort of asked me what I did and I, as I said I lied to them and said you know just a bit of this bit of that and just you know one too many one too many small things and then the TV that was on up in this little little perspex box that you know was protected so no one smashed it or whatever and 21 year old 22 year old professional surfer Clinton Philip Kimmons life oh, has been turned on its head a line to them all yeah and come, my story comes on the news and this picture of me like walking to court in the previous days and then I remember this one guy who was like the scariest looking dude in there just looks over and gives me a little wink and a smile and I'm like is that a wink and a smile is this guy gonna drag me into the room and do the unimaginable or and mm. turns out this guy was actually a really nice guy heavy serious person who was in for th- some pretty heavy things that I won't repeat but took a liking to me understood the situation he's like don't worry mate you'll be right and I think I was down in that holding cell six or eight days or something like that which underneath the courthouse yeah that was again you don't know the time when it's time to sleep you get put into a cell on the side by yourself and I remember like waking up in tears and like being cold I remember like waking up and then instantly doing push-ups at like whatever time of the morning it was. The cleaners would come in and bang your cell and like mess with you and I was just in this, is this a dream? And like I was in this, I don't even know how to explain what was going through my head, but I was just like, okay, be strong. Be strong for Carly. Be strong for my friends. Carly was my girlfriend at the time. You're going to have to get through this. Um, It was just so gnarly, but I was really trying to step out of my own body and think, well... If I was in Carly's situation, what would I want? And you'd want your partner to be strong, right? You'd mm. want them to get through it. I didn't want to be weak and express how much deep down I was hurting and how much I was probably scared. And I just wanted to get on with it and be... <laughs> sounds funny to say, like, I wanted to be a role model inmate, <laughs> if you know what I mean, in terms of my friends and my family. But, yeah, man, getting sent to jail at a young age is... um it's gnarly and it set me up for who I am now and so that sent, so you went from the holding cell and you did six months in a max security yeah yeah so I remember or was that like getting moved from there to getting put in a cell with a criminal <laughs> yeah well in all honesty this is how bad the holding cells were that it was actually better because I remember when I got transported I think it might have been late afternoon and they don't tell you when you're going because I guess the whole the, the jail systems are full they need to wait for beds paperwork to be processed and they don't tell you and then people would come and go people would get thrown in the tank with you and they would be drunk and it was just it was such a bad scene that when I finally got transported and it's like it's kind of like the movies in all honesty like you are shackled and like all this sort of stuff yeah, and you get put in a get in this little baby box and like if the car crashed man like I'm a bit claustrophobic and I was like put in a box this guy's knees in your knees and you're like shackled and there's a tiny little vent there it's dark and a light comes on and you just you know bobbling around and I guess they, they take the back routes they don't take the common routes in case someone's a high priority yeah, prisoner or something that, yeah they could break them out and again it's like sort of the movies but um the car trip I remember just went for so long and I was just like get me out of this thing and by the time I got out of it got out it was like a really clear night I remember getting a glimpse of the sky and the stars and went into this jail called Arthur Gorry up near Brisbane which is like an R&R centre. It's a maximum security centre that everyone, I think, of a high classification gets sent to before they get processed. And then um, you go through your medical and then they, you know, they test you for HIV and they test you for Hep B and I think they give you injections and all this sort of thing and ask if you are suicidal and you go through a psychological examination to see what sort of prisoner you are to Mm. get put in certain sections are you scared for your life? Do you know anyone in the jail system? Do you want to go on protection? Which you obviously don't want to go because that's where a lot of the pedophiles and a lot of the mm. people, like the really dodgy dodgy yeah. people go and those people notoriously get picked on in there. And I remember that guy in the holding cell just like, this is how you do it, mate. Like, you know, yeah. don't, don't say you're suicidal. Don't say you're scared. Just own it and just push on and just go to general population. 
And then I remember sitting there waiting for another test and I was sitting outside in this holding cell and it was a cool, clear night. But then you get, it's also like the hospital, like or where you are, the medical center is also where all the loonies are, like all the mental, I shouldn't yeah, say loonies, it's a bit nah. disrespectful, but you know, these people were yeah, loonies, you know, it's Ill. like mental yeah. mental illness patients were and they would come up to you and say things. I remember this one young guy, he had, I remember looking at bandages and scratches and like you could see the blood coming through like what he was wearing and, you know, obviously trying to self-harm. Going, have you been got yet? Like, you know, have you been got, bro? I remember you, you're cute. And he was pretty young and, like, you just automatically, like, go into, like, whoa, you know, what's yeah. this? And you don't want to sit there like that. You just, I remember cracking jokes back at him and playing along with it and things like that. But, um, yeah, there's all these little baby things that just, <laughs> it's just, yeah, makes you grow up pretty quick. Yeah, wow. And then walking through the corridor, getting put into a cell, got put into a young guy who looked like, you know, the stereotypical junkie. And this guy was really nice. Gave me a couple of Tim Tams and I was on the top bunk and he was smoking cigarettes, but gave me a few Tim Tams and, you know, spoke quietly to him because it was night and everyone, a lot of people were sleeping then. So I was just like, I still remember just how quiet it was and you can hear TVs off and the, the smell of cigarettes and all just this, it was just so gnarly. And then the next morning, when we got let out of our cells, I remember walking out into like the like the, the caged area, like the general area where people can hang in inside the unit. Mm. And then that guy was there, the guy that I was in the holding cell with, I was randomly put into his like his his unit. And I remember going up to him, I just remember his name is Smithy, which I think is like an alias. And then I just went up to him like, yes, I've, this, he's that guy. And I went up to him like, hey, how are you like that? And he just like brushed me. And I was just like, whoa. And he was standing with some heavy looking dudes. And he came up to me later, he goes, don't you ever come up to me like that ever again. Don't you ever show that type of emotion in this place. You stay neutral. And like he was angry, but he was also helping me at the same time. Yeah. He's just like, you stay neutral. And I was like, shit, okay, sorry. All the things that you've been taught and that naturally come out, it becomes a game mm. in there. Don't show emotion. Like I remember calling the, the screws, the officers, mate. It was like, cause I called people, mate. Like, hey mate, excuse me, mate. People got wind of me saying that and I got pulled aside. They're like, oi, they're the enemy. They're not your mates. They are the enemy. If you call them mate, you're going to have a really hard time in here. So again, I was just like, oh, okay. Like I was just so naive to that system. Like, of course, anyone would be. But um, again, it makes you learn really quick. Taught Mm. me to shut up, observe, look, learn. Mm. (laughs) Like it's just such a crazy place. Crazy. Yeah. So you did six months in there. Yeah, um, we, yeah, I'm excited to get to mate. that once you get out. What was it like? Yeah. Um, the last, I guess, like week or two in there, knowing you're getting out. The worst. The worst. Yeah, anxiety, like just through the roof. Because were you having like visitors along the way? Like, yeah, we had like visitors weekly, and that was gnarly too. Having visitors was the best and worst thing about it you because know, like, they just leave back to their life, and you're just walking back to your cell to yeah, like. Fisher, your stepbrother, would yeah. come in and visit me and he actually nearly got me killed in there. He was cracking jokes and doing all sorts of things, being the classic dude that he is and like not really realising that these are some serious people yeah. in there and I'm going to have to go live with them and he's in there cracking jokes and doing all these stuff, being loud. And I remember vividly guys like that, Seds would come in and all of my friends, I think my obviously my girlfriend at the time, she was just the biggest angel throughout that whole period, organising everything. I think they had a fundraiser to help pay for my court costs. You know, the whole surfing fraternity got behind me and she created a schedule of who was coming in and when and she was just... If you were to design on paper the perfect person to help you through a time like that, it was her. Wow. Like, her and her family and not only my friends, but she was the driving force and my motivation to do my time the best way that I can and get out of it as normal as Mm. I can, if not more positive and be the boyfriend and the partner that she deserves and whatnot. But, um, and that was when you really turned to fitness as well in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, were you pretty tight? Were you pretty dialed into your fitness for your surfing before you went in? Not at all. I was drinking beers, eating red rooster, had that young guy metabolism where you can't put fat on if you try. It was KFC pizza and you know, I was getting results by doing that sort of thing. So why change it? But the sport was a lot more raw and yeah, yeah, core yeah. back then, you know, like it was, there's a lot more hangover surfing done than there is. Oh, yeah. I think some of my best results came <laughs> off hangovers from young age. Like I remember 
celebrating the final before it happened, you know, like, and then going out there with this confidence and winning events. But um, I remember having a, a beer with Luke Munro at Newcastle before the final of the Pro Junior that I ended up winning, having a VB <laughs> and like paddling out, I think, late for the final. You know, oh, the different art. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, yeah. cool now. Yeah, but, um, yeah. So yeah, last couple of weeks, getting yeah. ready. Oh, no, sorry. Let's talk about getting into fitness in there because I know now your whole life is revolved around your fitness and your um, yeah. health. I just didn't want to, like I wanted to use my time as constructively as possible in there. I read a lot of books, did a lot of, inner work on myself tried to really overcome anxiety and things that I'd never like I probably never said the word anxiety before but in there it's like whoa what is this and had a lot of part of me a lot of help from some lifetime um inmates that gave me books to read and things like that I was I was quite liked in there which is good but it's also scary because you're so paranoid by being liked does does that mean the guy wants to sleep with me do I owe this guy a favour by him giving me a book like is he going to ask me to get drugs in for him or like you just don't know it was so scary how easily I got put into there and just how easy it is to get in the system but Mm. to this day I'm still paranoid like I hear an argument in a bar and I'm just like see I'm out like it affected me for years I wouldn't go to a bar if something felt weird I'd just get up and leave yeah but um, the fitness thing, I just trained in there. And it was really dodgy, like not just standard gym equipment. There's all these weird contraptions where you can't use free weights. So, you know, you're not going to have a bunch of criminals in there with these heavy weights that yeah. they could kill you with. And the, the kitchen cutlery was on these chains and all sorts of stuff. But I remember uh, <laughs> swapping this guy. I, had, I think the prison issue shoes were like Dunlop volleys. And I remember this guy coming up to me in buy up he was this Russian guy Vladimir something or other coming up to me saying bro I screwed up like I got canola oil instead of olive oil or the other way around or something he's like can you get me some oil and I was like, he's like I'll give you these shoes or like I might have said well what can you do for me or whatever and he had some um, Puma shoes and they ended up being half a size too small so I lost all my toenails but I remember getting in those shoes they were my trainers you know and like you can order them from Amart and stuff in there and they get delivered yeah. but I remember just getting these shoes off this guy and then getting one of those, um, is it, what are those wheels where you can judge, um, get the distance of an oval and stuff? Oh, yeah. And it was out the back of Brisbane, this place. It was scorching hot through summer and I remember like I, I mapped out this little 500 metre route around the oval and I'd just run and run and run. And then there was a tennis court in there. I'd play tennis and it sounds nice, but it's a lot different to how it sounds. But And then I'd play touch football and a lot of the, all the couriers were there and they sort of dominated the game and I was this little white idiot jumping in and they would never, I, don't, I think I touched the ball three times in about 30 games <laughs> and it'd be like, you know, I'd get floored and elbowed and it was pretty rough, but I just kept showing up and, you know, I had a pretty good relationship with those guys. Um, and I was just, all of a sudden I got known as the kid who trained, you know, they probably saw a very quick transformation in my body, probably through stress. I think I went in there at like, you know, 82 or 84 kilos. I was pretty, you know, I was pretty strong. And then um, all of a sudden I was just this rake and I was six packs and abs. And I remember Carly at times like, you know, I'd like, you know, kind of show my abs. And like when she'd come in, she was like, look, I'm getting fit. Cause I'd never been like That's that before, it, yeah, you know, yeah. like, you know, I was like, I was fit and I just got addicted to the training. Cause I saw the effect it had on my mental health and I felt good. It was the only one of the very few things I could feel good about was my mm. training. Um, yeah, so that was, I guess, the very spark of my journey into where I am now, being a professional triathlete that gets to compete around the world doing Ironman triathlons, and yeah, it's, yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. So let's talk about the day you got out. Let's. Uh, what was that experience like? Yeah, it, it I was feel like this is such a unique conversation that not many people yeah. would get to talk to someone about a prison experience, and I think it's um super educational, but also mm. just shows the situations that can happen. So yeah, what yeah. was um and it might prepare someone who might get into a situation like this as well one time to be able to come to this podcast and be like, shit, like this is maybe a little bit what it's gonna be like. Mm. Um, yeah. So what was it like getting out? What was that day? Um probably some of the worst days were the last week for sure because I'd gotten through my time relatively unscathed I didn't know what time they come and get you I didn't know the process of it like do you wake up and they come and get you or do you get out in the afternoon like you just don't know and I remember just the anticipation the antis- yeah exactly the anticipation and just like this is so close to being over that you just you can't control yourself and I remember being way too vocal about it 
and like when am I getting out like do you guys know and like being very open about it and very disrespectful to the guys who I was living with they're in there for life and they like the guy again I was very lucky pulled me aside and was like mate stop talking about it old mate over there is never getting out or he's got 12 more years and I'm just like wow how how dare I Mm. be so disrespectful to those people and like you just constantly get these checks that you're like it's a no bullshit check of like Mm. mate control yourself Anyway, going up, had a had a really good relationship with a guy who I was um, a kitchen hand for in my unit. His name, I'll, I'll leave his name yeah. out, it doesn't matter. Um, he asked me for a lift home. And, you know, like while he was my friend inside there, I was like, I owe it to my partner to like, I don't want to take the inside yeah. world to the outside world. And I remember having to respectfully decline him. And this, I think this guy had to get public transport or a bus and like it. It was horrible, but I had to yeah. owe it to my girlfriend and to myself to share that special time with her. Yeah. And man, I remember getting back in my suit. <laughs> it didn't fit me. I think it's JS from Fizz. JS has lent me a suit. Oh, yeah. At the time, it was this black pinstripe thing, and it was just like oh, was, it, I looked like a clown in it because I'd lost so much weight. And I remember the belt didn't fit, and all that sort of stuff. And getting back in my clothes, and then I remember walking out of the gates, and then I remember seeing Carly there. Like it just still brings tears to my yeah, eyes. Like yeah, you know, it's so much like I guess guilt that I'm still living with that this beautiful, normal, incredible person had to go through that. Like that I put her through that, and even though I don't bash myself up about it because what happened happened, that it just it's so unfair for her, and she's mm. just such a trooper, man, for what she went through and what her family went through. But um, yeah, I just remember, I remember sitting in the car. And uh, <laughs> it felt weird being in a car because you yeah, little wow. things, man. I haven't been in a car for six months. And I remember sitting in the car like, whoa, this is, what's this spaceship that I'm in, you know? Yeah, and yeah. she had a new Commodore at the time. And I just remember driving out of there and seeing how deep I was, like out in the bush and like where the jail was. And I was just like, wow, how are you driving out here every other weekend to come and see me? And like it really sunk into what I'd put her through. And, you know, there was all my friends that were trying to, reach out and organize a party or a barbecue or dinners and stuff. And I just remember I just wanted to just pay back her for her time and just wanted to be around her. And I just wanted to lay down and feel safe. You know, mm-hmm. like I just remember going back to our place and just laying there with her and just being in pretty much in peace and quiet and just feeling safe again. Like, mm. and that's when it sort of started to sink in just how gnarly it was and what, what sort of happened that, how dangerous it is and once you get put into the system how hard it is to get out of the system yeah wow you know like even to this day like I'm sure if I'm driving down the road and they do a random um, check on my rego it comes up you know Mm. it's like that's going to be me for the rest of my life and um, I remember getting a haircut too I think it was either that day or the very next day because I didn't want to get a haircut in there because you know you can get a haircut off the other prisoners but I just wanted to like I do these little risk matrixes of risk and reward by getting a haircut, something could happen, mm. you know? So I was just like, I'm just going to grow my hair out for six months. And I remember walking through Rabina town center, my girlfriend booked me into like a you know, nice hairdresser. And I remember the girl asking me, she's like, Oh, how's your week been? Oh, like, imagine I told her the truth. I was like, Oh, I can't remember if it was that day or the next, but I was like, imagine I just told her that I was in a maximum security jail as a prisoner for unlawfully wounding someone. Like, and that's what really made me think, and I carry this through today, that you just don't know people's stories. Mm. We can go down the street to the coffee shop and some guy can be rude to the waitress and we might be like, oh, that was a bit much. Or some guy might have a bit of road rage with you or be acting like a clown. You just don't know people's stories. They could be driving their wife to hospital to have an emergency operation. They might have just killed someone. They might, you just don't know other people's stories. So you just got to... Be empathetic. Yeah, or try your best to. It's not yeah. easy, you know. It's it's a real, it's a real process. But I just, yeah. Again, I vividly remember getting my hair cut and having to you know, white lie to this lady. Oh, good, thanks. Yeah, nothing much. Just standard, blah blah blah. And that was like another like slap of a fish slapping me in the face of just mm. like wow. And and then um, what was your first surf back like? My ribs hurt. I remember <laughs> my ribs hurting because I had laid on a board. But I actually went. I was so motivated. I woke up at 3 a.m. or something, went for like a 10K run under the stars and I was like, I think screaming like a, you I was free. Run where you want. 
I was like, wow, I'm free. Like, just, it was so overwhelming. I remember watching a surf movie, still getting to D-Bar in the dark, paddling out, and it was like D-Bar being D-Bar, one of the most crowded, high-performance, cutthroat waves in the world. The whole lineup was just like, any wave you want, dude. Mm. Any wave you want. I remember being so nervous because I was like, hadn't surfed in six months, and Fanning gave me some new boards. I remember he gave me this magic Simon Anderson, and everyone was just so polite. Like, Brooko, Troy Brooks gave me some boards, and... Um, like yeah I had my own quiver but I just had all of these people coming out of the woodwork to try and help me and it Mm. just really makes me appreciative and confident that you know I'm a good person and the people who really know me while there was a lot of judgment from people who don't know me it made me just really cherish and respect my friends for you know the empathy and the kindness that they showed to me through one of the hardest times of my life yeah wow but yeah had end up having a really good surf remember getting breakfast and I was just like so appreciative and motivated for the rest of my life yeah wow man thank you so much yeah. by the way for sharing that That's i know right. how hard and no it's it's yeah like i said i know some people are going to get a lot out of that and it's just going to at least make people a bit more aware of the circumstances <sighs> that unfortunately some people get in like you said it was like all of the wounds except for a little nick on his back is self-defense and this invisible line ends up putting you your family mm. your partner and her your whole community through a nightmare yep. but man it's so powerful to see how you've come out the other side and now what you've turned your life into mm. so let's um let's talk about this next little chapter so you got out tried to get back into the competing and surfing but obviously with a criminal record it makes it quite difficult to travel so yeah what was that next couple year period once you're what 23 and out of prison as a still one of the most talented surfers in the world but yeah how hard was that next chapter to fit back into normal life um I wouldn't say it was hard I was pretty motivated and stoked on everything and I was looking forward to it and I had this deep down inner confidence that I was going to turn this into the best thing ever like I was mm-hmm. like well what's happened's happened like this is a cool story I've got the opportunity here to make this the best story ever like what if I went on to win, win a world title after what happened to yeah. me like that's crazy and I'm very good at stepping outside of my own self and looking from the outside in and being realistic about what opportunities lay in front of me and I remember being so fit I ended up pretty quickly doing the best surfing I'd ever done um I was I got whilst I got dropped by Rip Curl whilst I was in jail when my appeal didn't go through because we appealed the whole thing for obvious reasons um got out got sponsored by Oakley or on a a a bigger and better deal with Oakley um DHD was making my boards Mick was giving me some of his hand downs which aren't too shabby (laughs) um and then I ended up being sponsored by Red Bull and getting on this thing called the WQS program which they handpicked a bunch of surfers. I think it was myself, Michelle Perez, Matt Wilkinson, Julian Wilson, um, Maddie Wilco, Gavin Gillette, Tim Bowl, some names that the yeah. listeners will probably be able to resonate with. Yeah. And I got picked a part of that team to travel as a part of an elite group of Red Bull athletes that want to leave no stone unturned in terms of how can we fast track these guys from the WQS to the CT. Yeah. And I had this incredible opportunity. And I think looking back, I took it too seriously. As you know, being a competitor, surfing is one of those sports that you can't force. Mm. I was forcing it. I think I was overtraining and not like surfing freely. I, mm. I tensed up. I had the, the worst probably string of losses in my entire life. And then I'd go free surfing and do the best surfing of my life. And the QS, as you know, is the biggest grind and cutthroat. cutthroat I just and I couldn't get a result I'd be in Portugal and I'd lose with a nine and a one mm. I'd have two eights and I'd lose and it's not not you know poor me it's like I just got my ass kicked yeah because of my own whatever was going on in my head I just wanted it too much mm. so um I remember coming home and then I'd take out my frustration by training a lot and then um all of a sudden I was like really enjoying these these training sessions you know like I can paddle out D-bar and have a surf and do something I've done a million times or I can go and experience something new by like riding a bike up a mountain or running somewhere I've never been and come home just floating on air and the endorphins and the the post-workout euphoria which is a real thing mm, it's just run so, so yeah it was setting me off and then um you know I I was doing okay to the point where, you know, like I potentially could have qualified if I had 
some string, like a run of good results come to Hawaii, but because of the criminal history, I couldn't go to the USA. So I'm just like, okay. And I actually, it's my own stupid fault by not doing the research I should have when I flew to America to do the US Open and then a whole bunch of stuff with Red Bull and then I was meant to go to Japan and then I was meant to go to Europe and then I was meant to go back through America to do more stuff with Red Bull and just this double around the world ticket. I ticked the wrong box by flying to America and ended up being deported. I remember standing there with Mitch Colborn. Um, they dragged me out to secondary and I was out in the secondary part for like over 10 hours and I remember just getting grilled like you're a criminal you've tried to sneak into the country and I was like again I was in this room and I was just like here we go again like what's going on like I don't understand it said like have you ever been involved in a crime of moral turpitude and I was like didn't even know what that meant I was like oh no I don't think so and my own stupid fault like I fully put my hand up for not doing the forms right the forms right and I was deported from the states um march through like this corridor and put on the flight i think first in front of like the whole um boarding lounge and i was just like all of a sudden i was this criminal again and that was a traumatic experience and then they didn't give me my passport till i was back in sydney ended up losing my bags i remember ringing anthony mcdonald who was the red bull team manager telling him the story and red bull being the legends and the ant being the, the top bloke he is ended up booking me like another full around the world ticket that the doesn't transfer through America. through America and then um, I was really bummed by that it's like no one qualifies without doing Hawaii I think yeah. Mick Taj very few people qualify before Hawaii those six yeah, star primes you need primes. those big events you need those big events and that's where I did my best surfing was in Hawaii you know that's where that was my place and time mm. to shine and I just I couldn't go back there anymore so I was really like well surfing's over the competitive side anyway and then also had a decent big wave career by getting, I think, not tooting my own horn, I think I was the number one most exposed surfer, I think, in the world when they do their trans world um, points table of yep. like who gets the most exposure for any surfers. Yeah, and for your values. And, yeah. yeah, I think I was like the number one in the world over wow. everyone and like definitely the most in Australia and all of that. I was just like, most of that was through Hawaii, my exposure over there. And I'm like, what am I going to do here? So I trained harder. And then ended up falling in love with running and a mate gave me a helmet and said, mate, if I give you this helmet, you've got to do a triathlon. I was like, okay, yeah, cool. I'll do one and trained for a triathlon out of not spite, but just out of frustration, I think out of a lot of frustration for the situation, but also out of frustration for small wave competitive surfing that I remember again, like the days I was on, I couldn't catch a wave, Mm. you know, and it's not playing poor me. Again, you know how hard the QS is and it's like, you do need a lot of luck, right? And the best guys win because they're so good and I'm not saying I was a victim to poor luck, but the the truth is sometimes you get unlucky and it it, it hurt me Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to whinge about it, so I trained really hard. So I was like, okay, what can I do? I'm fit, strong, super fit, triathlons for me. It's Mm -hmm. a first over the line sport. The more you get in, the more you get out. I was like, let's go. This is is cool. I want to do a triathlon. I remember entered the Kingscliff Triathlon, had a decent swim, came out in the, in the first few, went to jump on my bike for the second leg, bang, bang, pop tires. Oh. So I was like, here I am, frustrated and disgruntled by a sport where, you know, deep down I thought, oh, I'm a bit, un- bit unlucky yeah. here. And then the bike has a double puncture and I couldn't even do the bike leg and couldn't do the race. So I'm just like, what's going on? And then... um Ended up, you know, signing up for another race, using that as motivation, train extra hard and got a good result and fell in love with triathlon. Weird. Because I was the type of kid, like, who would be, like, out the car window going, nice like a dude, like, you yeah. know, that guy. And then all of a sudden, shaving my legs, wearing bright skin tight stuff, falling off at the traffic lights, not unclipping and, you know, wearing speed dealers <laughs> before they were cool, which they now are. Yeah. Um, maybe I set a trend or something. <laughs> no. Nah. But, um... Yeah, triathlon, I fell in love with it and I think got okay at it quite early in the piece and then um, started doing longer races. Like at the start, everyone starts out doing pretty short races, yeah. sprints, Olympic distance, and then you go into half Ironman and Ironman. Yeah. And then um, I qualified for the, the World Championships 
Triathlon or Ironman? Triathlon. Ironman. Sorry. Oh, yeah, Ironman. Ironman. Ironman's a gnarly. I've done a try. I did the kidney. Yeah. No, I did the Byron try a couple of years oh, ago. Oh, yeah, sick. No training. It was yeah. fun. So that was my first, the first race that I went and did and I completed Byron. was Byron. Yeah. Oh, that's me too. Mm. There you go. <laughs> Got something in common. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, like, okay. So you qualified for the world champs. Yep. Guess where the world champs are? <laughs> Coming to Hawaii. Oh. So, which is the USA. Um, went and applied for a visa this time. Thought I'd do it right and did it wrong. Like an exemption visa. Yeah. Ticked the wrong boxes, did the wrong thing, didn't get legal help with it. Flew down to Sydney for the appointment, got denied. And I was like, here we go again. My triathlon career is over, just like my surfing career. And mm. whilst I try and be positive and not use any of these things as like vices to feel sorry for yourself, I felt pretty sorry for myself. Mm. I was um, turned your life around. Yeah. We're not, it's not like was it was turned yeah, the exactly. other way, but you know yeah, what I mean? Like you've totally. like got something to be inspired towards, motivated yep. to, to achieve, and then. Mm. Um, but again, I took some pretty big lumps, couldn't go to. America and it not until I found this really good immigration solicitor called Becky Mendoza from Action Sports Law who worked tirelessly to get the right documents in place and I think it was eight nine years or something till I was able to go back to Hawaii but not did I I never thought I would have gone back to Hawaii a place that I went for between one and three months of the year for close to 10 years years surfing I'd be going there as a triathlete, I remember getting off the plane in Honolulu and walking through there. And then I remember first touching actual ground at Kona and like literally, it sounds corny, literally went down and kissed the ground. Wow. And I was just like emotional and teary and I was like, let's go. And then um, had a really successful amateur career in long course and short course triathlon and won most of the races I'd wanted to win. And if I didn't win, I'd be on a podium and somehow got sponsors um i think mainly because of not what i'd done in triathlon but coming from a surfing background having an interesting story um having somewhat of a, a social profile yeah on, on the instagram and whatever had some sponsors and i remember wanting to do justice to the amazing equipment that i was given i was like i've got the fastest bike in the world here i don't want to mess around and just take this half-hearted i mm. want to Show up. Do this bike justice, mm. you know? And I copped a lot of crap from people like, how's this clown, you know? How dare he get sponsors where there was legitimate professional athletes at the time who couldn't get a bike sponsor. Yeah. And I remember copping a fair bit of heat, which was hurtful at the time, but it also was a motivator to, okay. Do better. Let's yeah. do it. And then um, got my pro license to race Ironman triathlon. How's that work, going pro from amateur to pro? The qualification process is you can either submit like a resume type thing and like try and talk your way into getting one and most people... And what's most, the difference between an amateur and a pro license? Uh, amateur, you race and it's a different start time. You're just racing against people in your age group like yeah. amongst a mass field of 18-year-olds you know, yeah. to 70-year-olds but then you get classified and ranked on where you finish in your age group. So it's like an individual time trial. The gun yeah. goes off and you don't really know who's who. You just go through the day. Yeah. Whereas as a pro you start in your own way. You know exactly who you are. It's like, I know who Cooper Chapman is. His bike's not great, but his run's good. So there's a lot of tactics involved. I've got to ride the legs off him so he can't run. It's 10 times faster. You're not drafting. You're not slingshotting through people. Um, It is just so much harder. So much more to it. Yeah. And I knew, like, I I knew where I was at. Like, I was pretty realistic that, you know, I'm a surfer who's a good age grouper. And yeah. I can get some results as a pro, but I'm not going to be the guy winning Kona and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'd rather be a small fish in a big pond than a big fish in a small pond. Yeah. I'd ticked all the boxes. I'd won all the races. And yeah. it, it, I'm not trying to sound arrogant, but I'd go to a race knowing that bar something happening, like yeah, a nutrition or issue or, or a nutrition. GI, you shit your pants a hundred times or your bike fails that... I was probably going to win, if not podium, because yeah. of it's a it's a numbers game, right? Yeah, My numbers like you were, said, the harder you train, the you kind of know where you're going to be at. Yeah, so I was like, all right, now's the time to challenge myself as a pro, and like by saying that, I may not ever make it to Kona again, which is a place that holds great significance. So you to can me. go do Kona as an amateur, but then to go pro is very hard. You need to be in the top fifty in the world, wow. and the sport is no joke. Like yeah. it is 
kids have been in the pool since they were four yeah. on the bike and all that. And whilst I'm a pro triathlete, I'm, I'm never going to be beating some of these lifetime athletes. Yeah, yeah. You know? And that's just the way it is. It's not being negative. And I'd like to say I'm David Goggins and smash this and run down the wall, but come on, yeah. it's not going to happen. You're only setting yourself up for fail. Um, but yeah, mate, I'm loving it. I, I just love the sport of triathlon, how it can be your own creation. Like I do it a lot differently to other people. Like I'm self-coached. I've, I know enough about the sport to know what I need to do to be at a level that I'll be happy with. But for me, it's this personal journey about doing it my way. And I honestly don't care. Like, I don't even know my PBs and all that sort of thing where everyone's so analytical and they're Mm. like, what's this and that? And I'm just like, whatever. Like some of my best results are the ones where I finished 10th, but I know that I went so much faster in a harder field on a harder course and probably had a much slower time than if I had got fourth yeah. and like had a pretty easy day out or like, mm. you know, didn't have to go to the depths that I had to do to fight for that result. For me, it's about more of the journey. Yeah. It sounds pretty corny, but it's about getting to the start line, knowing I took no shortcuts. It's a really no BS approach to, yeah. and a good friend of mine, Sean Swain, always says triathlon or Ironman triathlon, how it used to be is like stepping into a room full of mirrors it mm. just exposes you like you know look at yourself hey? yeah you know when you've done the work you know when you haven't done the work it's how you deal with the adversity because in an iron man you're going to cop adversity once an hour mm. you know it is just so painful you've got to bust through these barriers of self-doubt um and rebuild yourself because you're basically out there for eight nine hours in your own head on the gas like on the rivet people think that the gun goes and you're like hey let's go it's like in the pro ranks the gun goes and i'm shoulder to shoulder with some of the fittest athletes in the world fighting each other for 3.8 kilometers in a swim you get out of the water you're sprinting to your bike like i see stars and have like blurred vision because you're going from being flat in the water to going vertical and your blood's going everywhere and then you get on your bike you clip in and you're straight up to race power yeah and you're fighting for four and a half five hours on a bike with (sighs) these guys and then you get off at 12, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm going to run a marathon. And then you're putting your shoes on going, am I just about to run a marathon right now? Fuck. I just rode 180 Ks on the rivet, full gas. You know, you oh got vomit on you, you got sweat, you got, you know, salts coming out of you, you've got gels all over your hands, it's hot, it's, hot, it's sticky, you know, your gooch is written off from, you know, sitting on a little carbon seat. Oh, just... And then you're putting your shoes on, not just like, hey, let's get through the marathon. You're going, okay, four minute pace, lock in, let's go. Four minute pace, holy oh, shit. You know, it's, <laughs> it's it's a gnarly undertaking, but I love it. It's so cool. How many of them will you do a year? Like, oh, last couple of years. Mate, I, last couple of years have been different because of COVID and all that yeah. sort of thing. But like, I'd try and focus on two a year and then a bunch of halves and then, um, you know, some smaller races in between. But now I'm a lot more selective because it's just it's so hard and where I'm at in my life it's like I'm actually pretty scared to go to those depths now like Mm. you know as much as I love it I'm like I know what it takes to go to that that spot and while I'm trying to step into this next phase of my life I think I'm softening a little bit and while I'm embracing that that softness I also want to respect the sport and not toe the start line until I know I'm in a place where I need to be. So I'm, I'm really selective of my races yeah. and what I want to do. Like, I don't just want to go up to Cairns again. I've done that race four or five times. I want to go to Frankfurt and race over there and run down the street of Frankfurt yeah, in Germany and, some, and then tie in sure. a holiday after that. You know, See. like I want to do things that I can sit, sit back and have a beer one day going, wow, I raced as a professional in, you know, Challenge Roth or I raced in Nice, France. I want to tick some stuff Sick. that I'm going to remember, you know. So, Fuck yeah. yeah. Man, that part of your story and your career in the, um, in the triathlete stuff is yeah. so wild. But the last chapter, not last, I'm sure there's plenty of chapters that we could go into, yeah. but um, Bondi Lifeguards, how'd that come about? Um, so I lived overseas for, out of the last 10 years, I was probably overseas for a good eight of those. I was um, working in Thailand as a triathlon coach at this really cool place called Tanyapura. It's like a high performance center. A lot of uh, F1 drivers, tennis players, swimmers go and do heat acclimation. It's like this really proper place. You yeah, think of Thailand, tin shed, kickboxing and that. This place is like NASA. So, uh, yeah. And then um, I was only there for six months. I planned on being there for a long time with my girlfriend at the time. And 
we broke up. She sort of got cold feet about the thing and I won't go into that too much, but um, we ended up breaking up and Thailand for me was going to be us starting yeah. a new life together. And when she was out of the picture, it just, I left there and ended up going, just wanting to go back home. I was like, I need to go back to the Goldie. I need to just reset, just, you know, hit pause for a little bit and just be home. Feel yeah. that, you know, that, that. I guess vibrational or gravitational pull of just being at home around mm. people who mean a lot to you. And then um, what the guy who was the CEO of the company I was working for is friends with a, a guy whose name I'll leave out of it, but he's a, um, he's a wealthy gentleman who was looking for an in-house personal trainer, a guy, a British guy, lives in the States. And they were like, Clint, you know, we think this is another great opportunity for you. Well, we we bummed things didn't work out for you here. Would you like to go over there and um and potentially work with this guy? And I was like, no, nah, don't want to know about it. You know, I'm over it. And then my friends, who knew this guy as well, said, mate, go over there. You've you're a young professional athlete. This guy lives in Bel Air. Go and live the high life for a bit. Even just do a month trial. Like go and mm. enjoy it. Do your job. Train the guy. Experience LA. Go have a good time. And then um went over there for a month trial and within three weeks he and I just said mate this is unreal we got along straight away this guy was the biggest legend we were training really well going out having a good time and um, I was living in Bel Air driving sports cars around living just this how how has this happened to me and I went from being super depressed about breaking up coming out of a relationship my life was going that way then all of a sudden it's going this way and not just like a small deviation it's going yeah. full gas in the other direction you know like I was riding my moped around to Thailand and then I'm driving a Lambo in <laughs> Bel Air and going to dinner and jumping on private jets and doing that whole 1% Crazy. legitimate 1% lifestyle and um, had a really good 3-4 years in, in the US um, I think so it's just three or four years like living in a guest house and yeah this guy. yeah it was on it was on and off um um, just for certain reasons. Yeah. I had my career aspirations to be a professional triathlete and um, this guy doesn't mind a drink and a bit of a party. He'd and go on and off with his training. Yeah, so I was like, oh, you know, I probably shouldn't be um, flying off to Vegas on a private jet to go and stay at the Bellagio and, you know, go and um, hang out with the boss. I should probably be training for my Ironman coming up and it just felt didn't feel right, you know. I'm pretty yeah. pretty honest with myself that I was like, Come on, mate. If you're going to be a professional athlete, yeah. respect the sport. Let's let's do it properly. So, um, yeah, I was on and off with him for three or four years. And then um, my time in LA just finished up and then ended up back on the Gold Coast, sort of just doing another, like, okay, find myself again. And then a mate of mine is like, mate, we need lifeguards. We just had, like, six or eight full-time lifeguards leave. I was like, oh, again, another Hail Mary. I don't know. I just want to stay put for a little while. Um, and he's like, trust me, you'll walk straight into a full-time job. And I was like, okay, could be good. Like lifeguarding's awesome. I was previously a lifeguard on the Gold Coast for eight years or something. I was like, it's a job you can train. It's really good for my career. Being a triathlete, it's good for surfing. Sydney gets big waves. Yeah. Um, why not? So I went down there, got the job as a full-time lifeguard. Um, yeah, Bondi was a pretty crazy place. You know, that place is full on like as mm. a lifeguard you deal with a lot down there give us a story what was one that you oh. just go like fuck that was man it, it's not a story I like to tell but I think it's a very important thing to say is the mental health and the suicides like it doesn't they on Bondi Rescue they don't show any of the suicide stuff they don't show any of the mental health stuff the things that we were dealing with especially throughout COVID the mental health because the thing, gaps right around the corner there and you guys are the first lifeguards around the corner those cliffs man those cliffs on average they say the police say it takes four lives a week by suicide and you've got young lifeguards going around basically on jet skis doing body retrievals of people who sometimes is a rigor mortis sometimes there's signs of life sometimes it's literally just like a corpse with fish fish, exactly and it's ugly and it's not healthy at all um but that was a really big thing in that yeah it's um those lifeguards down there do such a good job protecting 
the not only the people in the water, but the community. If there's a car crash, those guys are running across the road barefoot to pull out people. Just the other day, Harry is one of the best lifeguards mm-hmm. down there. Did race us on a, I think it was an eight week year old infant that fell from a two, like her dad's two, like two meter high shoulder or whatever. He did race us on the baby for like 40 minutes and saved this kid's life. Wow. Um, those lifeguards down there do such a good job and even though they've got a reality TV show that runs around it that shows a lot of the goofing off, they never really show a lot of the really heavy stuff that goes on, like mm. what we deal with, how we go away and deal with these really traumatic events and how tight and close that those guys are and the camaraderie and the respect that everyone has for each other. It's um, it's a pretty wild place. Yeah. But um, I'm not there anymore. I uh, my services were no longer required yeah. after they brought in a vaccine policy about the COVID vaccines. Um, I'm not allowed to comment on it any further, unfortunately. But the story is, we can leave it. I think people can work it out. Yeah, <clears throat> um, which is disappointing because obviously you work so hard, you put your life on the line every day for these people and then to get put out the side because disagreeing with the yeah. policy but yeah i know you've been dealing with that and not really meant yeah. much, but I'll yeah like, exactly let, like, listen to work out yeah you can jump on google or figure yeah. it out figure it out yourself but um yeah it was a really um sad ending to a, a good chapter of serving the community doing something i like to do doing it well yeah while i say this without any ego i'm Probably very. F- you'd have been the best, li- not the best lifeguard there, but the fittest and the most capable of saving lives. If, yeah, yeah. If you want someone to come and save you, if I want someone coming to save me, again, this is without ego. I'd want me coming to get them. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I'm not allowed to go and do my job because I didn't agree with something. But yeah, anyway, that's about all I can say on it. Unfortunately, mate. Um, but yeah, man. So what's this next chapter? So you move back up from Sydney. You're on the Gold Coast now. Yeah, what's um, what are you looking forward to? What's what's this next chapter? Like you said at the start, oh, coming back full circle yeah. from what you said, you've obviously gone through some <laughs> wild things. You've had some incredible life experiences with some big ups and downs. What um, yeah, what are you looking forward to in the future? You said before, maybe trying to raise a family. Mm. Some things that you didn't really think were maybe in the wheelhouse for your future have changed a little bit over the last future kind of years. What um, yeah, what do you got coming up? Um, waiting to get back on the beach as a Gold Coast lifeguard. Um, they don't have a vaccination policy in place here, so um, I guess the science is a bit different up here on the Gold Coast to yeah. down in Sydney. So I can um, work here as a lifeguard for the Gold Coast City Council, which is awesome. These guys are a very professional outfit, do a really good job on the beach, and I'm really excited to get back on the beach doing something I love. And mm. That's in the works. I, um, I'm i still chasing big swells. I'm looking at the maps every single day and hoping to get back to Nazare. Um, a year ago... I saw that in 2022. Feb- you got the bomb there, eh? Yeah, I wanted to show the world that you can still travel being unvaccinated and um, life isn't all doom and gloom in terms of COVID. So I, I, I booked a ticket and went over to, to Portugal. Well, I actually went to Spain because I wanted to be on the mountains in my bike and just get away from everything, you know? Yeah. And then I uh, saw a Nazare swell pop up and went there and ended up getting biggest and craziest waves of my life and really fell in love with Nazare. So I want to get back there as soon as possible and really have a red hot crack at this whole big wave thing. A um, few different motiv- motivating factors to why I want to do it. The whole COVID thing really knocked me around, knocked my mental health around a little bit. And when I was um, at Nazare last time, I was sort of like a, I didn't care about the consequences. I was like plan B for everything that was going on at the time for me was a very dark place of potentially not wanting to continue with life, you know, like it was, it was so serious to me and my values had been stripped. The people that I respected were saying and doing things that I just never thought would come out of their mouths. Humanity was turned on its head, the way people were treating each other, all of the things that I love and believe in was getting taken away through what I believe to be propaganda and media. And regardless of people's stance on a vaccine or anything like that, it was, for me, it was the way people were treating each other Mm. throughout that time. And not only dealing with it on a personal level, but also going to work and seeing the the impact of those lockdowns and everything with the suicides at work and everything was totally overwhelming. Mm. I um, lost 
a long term partner through that time. Um, life for me, I just couldn't. There wasn't much um, to look forward to, you know. So I was just like, "What do you want to do?" I was like, "I need to be in the mountains on my bike." And then when the opportunity came to go and surf the biggest waves in the world, I was like, "Well, I don't care what happens. Let's go." So I just went over there and sent it as basically as hard as I could. Because um, often people ask me, you know, like, "How do you do it?" And I don't often open up and just go, "Oh yeah, you know, like you know, I'm fit and healthy. I'm I can, I can surf like." Mm. I just, you know, went over and charged. But the, the truth is, you know, I was in such a dark place, I didn't care about the outcome. Wow. You know, and I know it sounds pretty traumatic, but again, I just want to come on here and be open and honest about I who I am and how I feel and what's going on in the world, you know? Like, I'm sure if you go onto my Instagram, you're like, oh, this guy's killing it, you know? Look mm. how happy he is. But, yeah, that's, that's the highlight reel, you know? There's so much substance to reason to why I am who I am, and that's a real part of it. And in saying that, that's what I... I'm proud of myself for working on it, you know? Like, I think I'm in a good spot now. I've overcome that where I couldn't see a light at the end of the tunnel back then. Whereas now I'm talking about starting a family. Like, I want to love and I want to be open and I want to experience life and I'm looking forward to what else is out there mm. with work, with sport, with partnerships, with friends, with mm. helping people that might be in similar situations to what I've gone through. There's just so much out there to look forward to that... Back then, I couldn't see that light. Now, I'm like, bring it on. Like, yeah. super motivated to um, do all of the above. Man, it's um, I know your story is going to help so many. This has been my longest podcast ever. And absolutely. <laughs> no, no. I, 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 was just, I was just about to say, absolutely rightly so. It's been incredible to get to hear your story, the ups and downs. Uh, um, yeah, everything. Like, you've been so open. I'm so appreciative yeah. of it. I know. There's um, been some serious dark times along there with some huge triumphs along the way. And like I said, Good Humans Podcast is all about hopefully giving people like yourself the space to share your story and show mm. that there's a good person in everyone, whether or not people want to judge you for what you went through. Obviously, by now hearing your story and the truth behind it, it just shows that no matter who you are, we can get in these really difficult, traumatic circumstances and mm overcome them and it's um yeah it's great to call your friend to have you in our sort of you know i mean family and friendship group up here mm. on the gold coast and yeah i'm really excited to see what the future brings for you man it's been a wild ride so far Thanks, and mate. hopefully um maybe a little triathlon with you this year mate me and yeah, my friend dude. harry dink and the boys were talking Sweet. about doing it maybe you can give us some training coming and some mate, sessions with you let's do it i've got i'm so fortunate i've got all the gear i've got all the bikes I've got oh, all if you've got a spare, spare bike i actually got, need mate, to yeah. borrow a bike oh yeah, let's dude. do it let's let's um i want to help out as much as i can because i'm such in a f good position that i've had so much help in my life and i'm again i'm at that stage where i want to start to give back a lot see you know, being a competitor from a young age you just like take 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 sort of thing and i'm like now i'm like man i'm so lucky like yeah. i want to start giving people what i've given been given so um mate yeah reach out and dude we'll get it done people out there too like don't be i'm not great on getting back to people but if there's questions that people have you know like i want to share my experiences and give people some tips and help out you know and it doesn't you don't have to pay for it it doesn't cost you anything and i think this whole mission that i'm on at the moment is about expressing vulnerability being honest being truthful but How also being you... kind compassionate you know all those like little cheesy cliche things but i truly mean that stuff living by like, values is yeah a powerful way to live and being truthful and like my my like i'm not religious at all but my religion is the truest truth mm. just let it out there yeah, and if okay. you let it out there it is what it is you know it sifts through all the bullshit pretty quickly people are either going to like you or not and if you know they don't like you that's cool man like good luck you. with your journey yeah. i'm just i'm just me yeah you know and it is who i am and working on it each and every day and um will continue to do so hopefully for the rest of my days man well i'm excited for the future but the last question i do finish every single good humans podcast with is what does being a good human mean to clint kimmons being compassionate to other people's situations as i said earlier in the podcast you just don't know what people have been through you know i think even if someone comes at you with aggression or you just don't know why they're doing that i think it's often people put onto other people what they see in themselves and it's not a direct uh reflection of what they think of you it's a reflection of what they see on themselves so mm. i'm constantly thinking about okay if this person's pissed off with me riding my bike in the gutter what are they dealing with in their life out. you know like just yeah be more compassionate and empathetic man i love it well thank you so much for this chat like i said this has been um probably one of the most eye-opening conversations i've ever had i really appreciate you being honest open and 
sharing some parts of your story that I'm probably sure you haven't really told too many people about. Mm. So thank you for coming on this platform, Sharon. I know a lot of people will get something out of it. If you did enjoy the episode, make sure you um, take a screenshot, share it, send myself or clean a message. I'm sure you'd be stoked to offer any advice if it's something to do with the prison system, if it's something to do with triathletes. Um, like you said, I know it's all about trying to give back and share your story. Man, surely there's a book coming. You're a writer? Yeah, mate. I, I'm definitely going to write a book. I, I want to finish it off. I want my final chapter to be either starting a family or doing something, a feel-good, really positive message, winning a big wave world title, doing something that's going to be a huge exclamation mark. But yeah, there's definitely going to be a book coming out. And whilst this has been your longest podcast, it's only a very small snippet into yeah. a lot of the things that happened in my life. So I, um, I look forward to going down that path in the future for sure. Mate, well, thank you so much. I fucking appreciate Thanks, it. Mate. You're a legend. Cheers. Um, yeah, see you soon. Everyone listening? <laughs> <Cheers guys. laughs>